Okay, so today we're going to be talking about camera trends, which is something that's like we've kind of been involved in camera trends since 2010. Mm -hmm. And I want to do like a quick little overview of camera trends, and then we're going to get into this great conversation with our guests. Okay, so when you go back into the 90s, remember when we uh, Tom Fletcher came and visited us at our office and showed us the very first HD Mm -hmm. camera and we were like wow this is interesting although we didn't really buy into it but a little before that we would still shoot video film style right mm -hmm. trying to emulate film and all that and then this was like a big step toward getting even yeah. closer to that so the fact that it was 24p and of course had higher resolution was really interesting although what bothered the crap out of us was to flicker on the monitor and it kind of reminded <clears> us of when we shot film and used a, a film tap yeah, it looked of, exactly right. the same. Okay, well, the three two pull down also changed things, but that, now we're getting on, you know. Okay, so well, it was two thousand one. That's right. We got our first very cam, and then we got several others in our rental department, and that really changed the game because it looked, it had more of a film look to me than the Cine Alta, mm -hmm. and it was twenty four p, and it really looked like you could shoot a movie with it. Well, it, it didn't have that flicker issue too because they did the three two pull down, so it was all kind of a much more natural right. feel, and 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 it didn't bother you that way yeah we didn't we, I missed one part but the between right around 2000 when the HD really started to take off was when Robert Altman did that that movie I can't it was what was the name of that thing um, it was even shot here in Chicago wasn't it it yeah. was about dancers and whatnot yep. anyways that's when the Cine Alta and everybody was like whoa and then we went to an NAB around there and we were like wow this could actually happen okay so then this camera came out mm -hmm. and we were like Wow, this was something this is, special. This is the DVX100, and it was standard def, but its unique feature was that it had the 24, 24p feature, which was really cool. So a lot of indie filmmakers, you know, a lot of entry-level people were getting into this and starting to create looks that were, you know, filmic, if you want to call it that. Well, so we I, used it. So I guess, in, in a way, to me, this was one of those, this is where a trend kind of started, you know what I mean? Oh, this changed everything. Remember, we were doing corporate videos at that time, or actually, no, we were doing all kinds of videos, and this thing was like, because prior to this, we were using like a PD-150 and trying to make it look yeah. film-like with by using filters and whatnot. Exactly, right. So this was and, just another tool in that direction. Okay, this changed the game and really... <laughs> a big time for us, actually, Yeah, too. exactly. So this camera comes out. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we're sitting here with $300,000 in E&G Vericams, and I contact the CEO of Panasonic, and I say, dude. What are you doing to what us? What are you doing to us, man? This, by the way, is the HVX200 for people. Right. <clears throat> now, now you can buy pretty much what you can do in the Vericam for five or six grand, whatever the thing costs. To me, I feel was the big industry disruptor. You know what I mean? Because it changed rental departments, certainly changed ours. We had to pick a direction and figure out what to do. Like I said, it created a cottage industry of accessory uh, manufacturers. Right. I think it started right around with these cameras. I mean, it did for us. Okay. So then this kind of crazy thing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole depth of field <clears throat> adapter. It came uh, about with the HVX 200. That's right. Uh, time period. Right. Because we yeah. wanted it to look more film-like. So you're actually projecting the image onto like a piece of spinning ground glass. I mean, now that you had HD and you had 24P, the right. lacking thing to match film was the d lack of depth of field. Exactly. So this helped that whole cottage industry of uh, accessory makers. Um, Red Rock was yeah, pretty Brian, much born Yeah, gotta this. give Brian Valente two thumbs up on this man. Yeah. Him and the PS Technics people really kind of developed this whole depth of field adapter mm -hmm. thing and then came Lettuce. Okay, so. Red camera, obviously. Remember people waiting in line at NAB, big yeah. splash. Right. It was like going in a Studio 54 in yeah. New York with their little tent. Well, this is where the larger format um, sensors, you know, are starting to make their, you know, their debut. Yeah, guess, but this right? was a cinema camera. All of a sudden, now we stepped into the cinema camera market. Yeah. Okay, so the now big disruptor. Yeah, big disruptor. <laughs> Originally, this camera came out. They really saw this as for stringers. Uh, new stringers to go out and be able to shoot photos and catch some video and not to have to have two people go on location. Right. They did not see the fact that uh, people were going to look at this camera and go, wow, it has sh super shallow depth of field and uh, it's course, HD video and in HD video and in 24p. Da, 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 da. And when we first got an early version of this camera, you and I were like, holy crap. Uh, you can't look through the viewfinder, the actual ground glass viewfinder, because the mirror comes up and blocks it. It's a DSLR. 
So you have to use that little tiny low res screen on the back. And then we saw an opportunity there. We yeah. And I remember that day too, I grabbed my, I was like Hasselblad um, loop, loop yeah. stuck it on the back of there. And we were like, there you go. Something was born. And that really was the beginning of Zakuda with our, mm -hmm. our Z Finder. So mm -hmm. the Alexa obviously is a huge disruptor. This camera, we, we even though we didn't jump the picture, uh, uh, you know, it's only two and a half K, somehow they made this thing, it's filmic. Well, uh, w this became like a standard in the television industry and film yeah. industry. Yeah. For a long time, and even to this day, mm -hmm. I remember saying 75% of every television and motion picture is shot with the Alexa. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that number is today. Let's move forward. Another big disruptor. Mm -hmm. uh, See, we sort of almost have to categorize this. There's, there's this professional level, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the Alexa we saw in the, in the red and all that. And then there's these more consumer ones that I think are kind of more of the disrupting kind of things that affect the higher end eventually, you know what yeah. I mean? Okay, so now we're getting into today where you have these interesting individuals, indie film makers, indie, camera makers. Indie camera makers, I guess. And uh, we're with the Z Cam and the Kinfinity, let's move on to the next image. And this is what the mirrorless whole world came in. And now we actually still not doing what I want to do. We're not optically focusing the camera. Right, but at least now this is a big step over the, the 5D thing where you don't have a mirror blocking it. You have actually a high quality viewfinder that yeah. you can use in the camera. Yeah. So to me, it's a step up, but now we're back to that form factor of the 5D, which you know, brings other issues up. So that you've got these two worlds. You've got the, the handheld you know, still camera form factor, and then you have like what the, the C300 was born out of the large sensor yeah. craze, but with a more professional yeah, super housing. 35. You know what I mean? So. All right. Now let's go to Mandy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we have Eric Naso uh, with us. He's a DP and the U.S. correspondent for New Shooter. Um, and then we also have Clayton Moore, a freelance camera op editor and writer, and he uh, contributes for Red Shark. Uh, so we're going to have a fun, interesting conversation today about the camera trends. Okay, Eric, how you doing? Yes, sir. I'm doing great. How you guys doing? Good. Okay. Let's give uh, our guests just a little bit of history about you, and then we'll uh, introduce Clayton. Okay, great. Um, basically, my 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 experience is I'm a DP. I but my really started off in photojournalism. Uh, I was a, basically a, a video guy for broadcast television and, and uh, worked in a lot of local markets throughout the country. I started in that beautiful town of Bakersfield, California, but then I ended up going to DC and uh, eventually throughout my career. And now I don't shoot news anymore. Uh, I do all promos and commercial production for the local NBC station here in San Diego, and, uh, and I love it. But my experience with photojournalism was, was a good one because that really helped me learn how to shoot fast, edit fast, think fast on my feet, and I kinda like to apply that skill to doing uh, video production as well. And and now I also work with uh, newshooter.com. I'm their US correspondent. So cover the trade shows and do lots of uh, camera reviews. Okay, terrific. Clayton, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. How are you guys today? I mean, it's Great. interesting. It's the first time I met you, but we email each other once a week for how many years now? I, I It's kind of weird, but uh, great to actually meet you. Yeah, so, um, a little history about me. I started out in broadcasting uh, quite a while back in the 90s at a local uh, UHF uh, station here in Sacramento. And uh, <clears throat> sometime after that, I ended up at Apple. So my uh, my whole technological or my whole experience in video is kind of a technological one. Um, and of course, it's involved uh, software and NLE technologies, but some video stuff in general. Um, I got into the whole uh, DSLR uh, revolution, which was really exciting to me. Since then, I've done a lot of stuff with uh, nonprofits and government from everything from doing promos um, and uh, a little bit of documentary stuff and some video streaming. A lot of, lot of stuff, but my, my interest is very much in video technologies and trends. So uh, that's why I'm kind of excited about uh, sharing ideas and stuff today about this. So. Mm -hmm. Terrific. The reason that I told Mandy to have mm -hmm. you on the show is because you're always sending me these interesting links about camera trends and all this kind of stuff. So Mandy, 
Uh, I know that we've had a lot of email contact with people to develop you know, the topics that we're going to talk about today. What's the first topic you want to get into? Uh, I think the first one is with the release of the Panasonic S1H, um, do you think we're heading towards another round of DSLR, DSLM cameras? Um, I think we can talk a little bit about that and kind of maybe predict the future. All right, what is this DSLM again? I, I forget what that stands for. The mirrorless. Isn't that Panasonic's Digital new acronym? Yeah, so in other words, the yeah. DSLR is the non-mirrorless uh, camera and the DSLM is, is basically the mirrorless yes. version. Yeah. And it, so I guess what the question here is, which is interesting, <laughs> is for a while there we had the large sensor uh, you know, when the, uh, we were bopping back and forth a little bit between what I call the mid-range cameras, which are the FS7s and the C300s, be, that are a little more ergonomic and film-friendly uh, to people like us who are accustomed to big, mm -hmm. normal cameras, and then these DSLR, DSLMs. So, Clayton, what's your thoughts on this? Do you think that uh, that we're heading back to a, or, or is this going to be like a 50-50 dueling battle from this point forward? Well, I think that uh, DSLR is slowly kind of fading into the background, and I think what's going on with the major manufacturers and and these interchangeable uh, still form factor cameras is kind of a harbinger of that. But if you look at if you look at I think it's the Japanese Camera and Imaging Products Association um, stats basically say that uh, Q1 of last year to Q1 of this year we're still about well over 30 percent down in uh, sales and camera shipping. And that's, those are these uh, still form factor cameras, DSLRs and DSLMs. So what is the future of cameras like the S1H, which is a, a particular mm -hmm. form factor camera that also shows digital video? It's difficult to say because that market, generally speaking, appears to still be in decline. It seems to me that to take a camera like that and to price it at a certain level and to give it a lot of um, moving picture image IQ is something that they're probably needing to do. What's the future of that going to be? I think what Eric's did, uh, what Eric did with the Z1, we're kind of focusing in, I think, in a particular price point and camera size. Um, but I don't know about the future of DSLR, DSLMs. That's well, let's say, hmm, let, hard to say. Let's ask Eric what his opinion is. I mean, yeah. the, you know, there's the, he, he brings up an interesting point, Clayton, that there, there's sort of, I don't know if the price point is what, I mean, because now we're talking this, this new Panasonic camera is 6K, you know, so it's like $4, for four grand. 6K, yeah. I don't know if it's a money issue or a form factor issue. Yeah, I mean, actually, it, it does kind of surprise me the, that, you know, when, when Clayton says that these numbers are going down and there's not selling so much, but... To me, being in the industry, there's a lot of excitement for these cameras still. I mean, I don't, I know probably in the broader sense, a lot of people, as far as when you talk about consumers, they're probably using their phones more now to shoot video and photography. And that's probably what's really killing off these, these bodies and, you know, interchangeable lens systems. Uh, but I mean, the quality that you're getting out of these small, these small, I, you know, iPhones and Androids are, are pretty stunning actually it's amazingly good i think we're going to continue seeing more innovation from these hybrid cameras i just see that people want them and even if it's not growing i still think that you know each company is going to want to be the king of the hill of these things but with the a7s3 i guess is not out yet and the way that's kind of been delayed and we're seeing this innovation happening with canon and now panasonic and even nikon uh, it, it's interesting to see how they're kind of waiting and we're going to have to, we're going to see what they're going to do. They obviously have to do some kind of big splash because, mm -hmm. you know, that Panasonic camera's loaded. One of the reasons that these cameras could be in decline is because we're not factoring in the used market. So, mm -hmm. you know, in 2012 in our shootout, we already determined that, that any of these cameras could look great. So uh, many people don't have to have a 6K camera, so they could yeah. be buying used cameras, and there are a lot of cameras out there. What do you think, Clay? There seems to be a lot more, perhaps Eric can speak of this, a lot more um, firmware updates rolling into cameras, which is giving the camera body a much longer life than it used to, to have. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine being in the rental market trying to keep up with all the new products all the time in your inventories, but um, it just seems to me that 
you're right. He's right about the phone idea. But we're in we're talking today about kind of a niche market, which is creating video or movies with cameras over primarily stills. Today, we're going to be talking about the Polaris base plate system. Take a look at all that. We're going to show you how to put all of that on here in seconds. OK, here we go. It starts with the camera plate. OK, wow. so <laughs> I, I mean, we shot that in 4K, yeah. you know, which is, you know, it, we played it on the web. Oh. With an iPhone. With an iPhone, All right. <laughs> so, uh, it go. was... Well, this leads me to the point that I wanted to make is that the, there's there's a camera for every job, all right? And now they're so cheap, right. there's no reason why you can't have several of these cameras that are best suited for a particular job. Some cameras are going to need more outs, you know? Some cameras you need a small, you know, need it to be small to be on a drone or whatever. Uh, so I got a feeling that there's going to be plenty of space for both classes of cameras, these DSLMs as well as the larger uh, versions. When we shot that video, we didn't use any extra lighting. We shot it right over here on our stage. There were all kinds of practical lights going on and, and studio lights and all this stuff. We took out, I don't know, some kind of a DSLR M type, th an M. And we were like, wow, we got to add supplemental lighting and do all this. That iPhone's got some way of just making everything <laughs> look amazing. And stabilized. <laughs> and you, you brought up a point. That thing was made for the web, okay? Mm. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to have it in 4K? Why do we need... How many people really are doing... I've been saying this for years. Are doing something that absolutely is going to end up on Amazon and really needs to be in 4K. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Eric, what's your opinion on that? Well, like it's a natural progression and it has been going on since standard def and even before. Uh, I think standard def to HD was probably the most relevant jump that we did because it changed the aspect ratio. And, you know, now adding more Ks, in my world, I shoot 4K primarily or UHD and I deliver in HD and I like having options. And I also think it's better to shoot in a higher resolution than your delivery format. You just, it just gives you a better output in compression, everything looks better when it's bigger going smaller as opposed to going sideways. If you're gonna deliver in 4K, you might wanna shoot in 8K or 6K. And, and, and it's just gonna continue, it's never gonna end actually. But and I'm cool with it, it's, it's uh, you know, storage is getting better and cheaper, computers are faster and they're not really quite getting cheaper, but they sure are getting more, uh, much stronger and be able to process these larger files better. So you think Moore's law is applying to this? Although at, at a certain point, you won't be able to resolve. Our eyes won't be able to resolve anymore. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I still contend that, I, I don't even know if we shot that in 4K. I just said we did. We could have shot that in 1080 for all I know. I, Mandy, I hear you got a question. Yep, um, I actually have a question from Nino. Um, he is, was addressing it to Eric, saying, how come we're not mentioning the Fujifilm? They're absolutely killing it with regards to video mm -hmm. features and their mirrorless line. Good question. Hmm. They absolutely are. In fact, I'm using an X-T3 right now, I'm going through my computer. So yeah, I love that camera. Um, I, I'm not a big uh, you know, mirrorless hybrid user in general. I like dedicated video cameras. I'm just, maybe I'm old school. I just like not having to deal with a lot of boxes that like getting audio to convert in there with small, tiny little connectors. But yeah, I think the X-T3, you know what I'd really like to see? I would like to see Fujifilm get into the cinema camera market. They have everything but a camera, <laughs> like really a serious camera. <laughs> that, would, that would really uh, be a, a, a really great addition uh, into this whole video camera wars that's going on out there. I gotta admit, I was really not into these DSLR, DSLMs, but nowadays there's not what ergonomically, to me it's more an issue of you know, a lot of what I see on TV is shoulder mounted. Now, hmm. getting those cameras on your shoulder is slightly, well, it's not really, but it's slightly harder than getting a mid-sized camera on your shoulder. But I don't, is there a feature that you feel like is difficult using a DSLR M? I wear glasses, or reading glasses, and the, the, the EVS on most cameras are really not all that great. And of course, that tiny little LCD screen in the back is not sufficient to get proper focus, to make sure you have everything you need as far as exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, so I have to add either an EVF or I have to have uh, a monitor or I have to have both, which is like how I had the E2 set up. Um, yeah. Then it becomes a camera. I can control it, I can see it, I have confidence in it. 
I mean, that's really important to me is knowing that I have the shot. And that's very difficult to do with a just a camera right out of the box that's a, like a mirrorless hybrid. Coming from a manufacturer's point of view um, or standpoint, do you think that the trend with these uh, DSLMs would be to rig them up or to use them in their in their small size, uh, in their natural, more natural state? I think people are really uh, definitely interested in how to acquire the image as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, we're in a situation right now where we almost need to separate the image, put the image over here, with everything else about the camera, the ergonomics, the, mm -hmm. the size, the buttons, what it can do. So you have two, two things where image is becoming so good across the board that that's almost something that's ubiquitous that you can take for granted. The rest of it now has to do with what do you need personally as a shooter to make this work for you? So that's where I think Zakuda has an opportunity to figure out what the market really needs and to go that route. But something I want to address to Steve real quick, he made a mention about the iPhone. What you're alluding to is something we call computational photography. That's what's built into the iPhone and some of the newer stuff. And I think that technology is gonna roll more and more into the cameras that we use on a daily basis because there's some powerful stuff right there that could be working for us that could help um, maintain a certain competitive advantage in those kind of cameras. But Jens, as far as I'm concerned, whatever you can do to make cameras more efficient at getting what we need every day Whatever that is for people, it's different. At our age, yes, weight and size and balance. All right, Mandy, let's move on to another topic. Yeah, so uh, we keep mentioning the new uh, uh, Z cam. And so with the, we've seen the Z cam, the Confinity. Do we think that these will survive in the market against the big guys, Canon, Panasonic, Sony? Um, and if so, what will they need to do to, to survive? Mm. I mean, it's an interesting mm. topic because, you know, what is survival is my first question. You know, I mean, the cost basis, well, first off, you have two things when you develop a product. You have your sort of R&D, uh, you know, like how much does it cost to develop it? How long is it good for? I mean, I'd be scared. We've talked about making a camera and that scares the crap mm. out of me. Changes too mm. quick. I don't even want to own a camera. <laughs> I know, <laughs> you know, right? Yet design a camera That's so like topic, we got out of the rental business because the cameras were changing too fast we just couldn't keep up in the and and your inventory becomes worthless at a certain point let's start with eric because this seems more <laughs> up your alley you know can these kinds of companies survive and are people afraid to buy them because you know they could go under i, I don't want to say things like that but we always worry about parts service blah 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 yeah um, yeah, I think the what, what I've learned about Zcam with the E2 is, you know, you have something so small, it's it's like you think, well, this is a real benefit to have a small camera. I mean, you can put it anywhere. The thing is, like, literally a box that's only maybe a, a little over three and a half inches around. It's just tiny. and But, yeah, you have to add all these things to it to make it work. And that might play into your favor if you already have a monitor or if you already have, like, a graphical HD, you're good to go. It's all about what codec these cameras are shooting, the frame rates that are capable of doing, that's kind of kind of be what you're interested in when you're looking at a, at a camera right now. And you look at the E2, for example, and even with the Confinity, they're going straight to ProRes. They're getting over 100, 160 frames per second in 4K on the E2 uh, that shoots in H.265. I think those kind of things are what's really going to drive these cameras now. It's more about those internal features, uh, you know, frame rates, uh, what is it, uh, time lapse modes. All these things are really going to have to sell a camera more because, like we were mentioning earlier, you know, dynamic range. I don't even test for that anymore. I mean, these all these cameras, like, why even bother? They're so good in that aspect already. Those are the kind of things that I think people are looking for more so than just the Ks. I was going to say the answer to Mandy's question is, uh, are they going to survive against the big players, these small cameras? I think that largely depends on those players, Panasonic, Canon, and, and uh, Fuji and all those people, and Sony. How far do they want to take some of the features those other cameras have and what's possible given the size of the body because you have to worry about heat, battery life, and other aspects of it. Um, so it's pretty much, I think, largely dependent on the players other than Kinefinity and um, the Z camera people. 
camera companies, you used to buy a camera, it had an EVF, it had every single thing, the recorder, everything was built in, and it was $85,000. But nowadays, the concept is to just build the, the camera box and have, it's all about price. You know, you wanna keep that price low. One thing that people need, need to realize is that this DSLR, DSLM market is 10, to, I don't wanna say 10 times, I don't know, but it's infinitely bigger than the mid-range camera market because the, even Canon one time told me, you know, they're not making oodles of money from their cinema line. You know, they just wanna be a player in it but really, they're a glass company. That's what they will tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and that supports their glass business. Eric, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, to be honest with you. I mean, they are, and, and they have their look, and that, you know, you might as well have a camera to, you can slap on the back of all those wonderful lenses. And we go back to that same thing. I kind of feel like that'd be really great to see Fujifilm get into camera bodies, because again, they are a glass company. They have they they've got the gamut. They got cinema. They've got broadcast. They have down the still lenses. Uh, yeah, you know. I mean, it's yeah. I agree. So uh, are we boiling I this guess. down to? Wait, I think Mandy's got another question oh, here. Okay. What was that, Mandy? Sure. Yeah. So we kind of have a discussion going on on the Facebook feed um, with uh, Nino and a couple other people. Nino says, "I think a sign of things to come are cameras with Android as an operating system. It's just the first step, but it has the potential to grab the market if done right." Think about photography with the upcoming Zeiss camera. You'll be able to do raw corrections in camera with Lightroom Mobile and then continue working on those photos when back at your desktop or iPad Pro. And we also have um, Mitch saying, funny, that not that I'm any kind of profit, but I was saying in 2012 that camera companies need to have an iOS Android operating system. And I still believe that is true. And that's Mitch um, from Planet 5D. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, this is so existential at this point. It's getting <clears throat> crazy, but I do know that we have friends that are DPs and they hate the idea, I'm talking about for television and film, of passing off your footage mm -hmm. because it used to be that they would pay the DP to come in and do color timing. Nobody does that anymore. Right. And now you feel, Ooh, I don't want to just deliver this you know, raw video that they could do anything with. Mm -hmm. They could color mm -hmm. it any way they want. Uh, Nino, you guys work on that, and we're going to move on to another topic, but I want to readdress that. What's next, Mandy? Clayton, in his recent article for, um, for Red Shark, quoted Barry Green in an article about picking a camera as saying, we passed the threshold of image quality being the determining factor a while ago because every camera produces great images. So to me, it's what hoops do I have to jump through to get those great images? Do you think this holds true across all aspects of filmmaking? I think, Jens, you said this best yeah. in that there is a camera for every job. Mm -hmm. When we used to rent, we would rent, you know, I always said this, I do not want to jump out of a Humvee with an Epic in my hand. Mm -hmm. I want to jump out with an A7. You know, if I'm in a war zone, there's a camera for that. If I'm shooting a wedding, there's a camera for that. If I'm shooting a commercial, there's a camera for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, what yeah. else can you say to that? I mean, but the thing is, this is what you can say. People are buying a camera and they're trying to make it work for everything. Yeah, well, I call that the silver bullet camera. It doesn't really exist. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. exist. Right. All right, Clayton. Well, I think that's really true. <clears throat> and it comes down to the fact that, that um, some cameras are better suited for some jobs than others. And now the great part is we have so many terrific cameras to choose from. And the question that, that you addressed before, which again goes to computational photography, either Android or iOS, I think it's gonna be capable of doing just about anything you can possibly imagine. Understand that companies like Apple are not sitting on their thumbs as this whole thing is happening. They wanna make phone cameras be as amazing as they possibly can going forward. It's about competition. That's gonna drive stuff like that into a space that we can only imagine right now. So. Yeah, to roll that into the cameras that we use, the whether the DSLR, DSLRs, or the, the or otherwise camera bodies that are cinema related, that has to happen at some point because people need to see that kind of power in their cameras, I think, going forward. Hmm. Eric, how many cameras do you have? Um, personally, I really only have the X-T3 right now. I tend to go through them, but I don't collect them. I, I find Wait, that you don't have an to be iPhone? a very dangerous... Habit. <laughs> you don't have an iPhone? 
or an Android? Oh yeah, I have an iPhone. Hmm. But you, didn't, you didn't even one. include that. It's an iPhone 6s. No, I don't. I, I don't like to depend on my camera, my photography or video with uh, my iPhone because it's just not that good. Um, and to, hmm. to kind of further on that, I'm not really sure. I guess in a in a real uh, like a high end consumer kind of, I got to shoot it and get it on Instagram, and you want it on your uh, have an iOS and an Android kind of an operating system on your mirrorless camera. I mean, I, I think that would be fun, but I don't know if that would be something I could use professionally. I guess if you're a photojournalist and you're in a war zone or you're covering a court case and, but you can kind of do a lot of that stuff, I guess with your phone anyway, you can just have it send images directly to your phone. But video is tougher because I haven't had, at least I don't have any experience with one yet where you can actually get a decent video clip from your phone, I mean, from your camera, like a, like a Fujifilm X-T3 or a Panasonic, to, directly to your iPhone quickly, you, it, without having to sit down, plug it in, and transfer it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. I've actually, you know, uh, they've all claimed to do this, you know, where you take a picture and it bops into your phone immediately. Mm -hmm. Never really worked well for me in mm -hmm. the past. But that would be an amazing thing if they if you're like shooting and it's instantaneously going to your phone. But every couple of years I go to B and H and we have a meeting with them and they're like, and the first question they ask is, is the point and shoot market dead? Yes. The second question <laughs> they ask is the mirrorless market or DSLR market dead? Because no. they're trying to figure out. And every time right. I say no and no, because there are times when I like using a point, really high-end point-and-shoot camera. Mm. And I know that Phil uses them. I know Nino uses them. Yeah, uh, but they're on the decline, for sure. I don't know about that. There's it's no that, better camera than the one in your pocket. My issue with, with the phones, and we've been talking about this forever, the second you give me an 8X zoom that's, not, that's optical mm. and not digital, it's game over, man. I'm going to be using my iPhone for everything. Clayton, you're up. Well, I think you're exactly correct. It's all about sales, really. Um, so how much money can they make selling a given product? Um, you may may like the point and shoot stuff, but it depends on what the market does there. And if it gets to where it doesn't make any more sense for them to make it, they'll just stop making them. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right about the, the, the camera phones. I mean, you know, with the, again, the computational thing with my iPhone uh, 10s, I guess it is, being able to do that portrait mode where you can kind of do the blur out the background, get a little bokeh, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Kind of a fake thing, but honestly, I've shot some photos that looked really pretty impressive. So how far down the road are we from? Here's the thing to keep in mind. It's called good enough. That's yeah. something that us professionals tend to recoil from, you know, but it's a fact out there in the world of people paying for content. Um, mm hmm you can't really walk away from that, unfortunately. God, that pisses me off because it used to be I was a portrait photographer and you were a uh, product photographer. Mm. And we spent hours making these gorgeous portraits and now every asshole in the world takes their <laughs> phone, they hit all these crazy modes and they're coming out with pictures that are stunning. Mm. And it's like, is it fair? In other words, if you can do all this digital manipulation, you can literally take a turd and polish it, as we used to say, mm -hmm. and turn it into a gorgeous photo. It's like, it's not even photography anymore. It's some new art form, and it's just making manipulation. me angry. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. Steve, my dad told me a long time ago, there's no such thing as fair. Yeah, no, that's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're focusing a lot on cameras, but I think one thing that people need to work their ass off harder on is, is lighting because, mm. you know, the, we all have to look good. Things have to look good, and lighting is very important. You might be able to get fake bokeh <laughs> out of an iPhone, but, uh, you know, these cameras, yeah, with, with being able to shoot in such low light now, you can boost those, the ISO so high, and they look so good, you know, right. you can have small light packages. And I think that's that's where I kind of tell people to focus your attention on that. Keep that camera. If you got a 4K camera, don't worry about the next K camera. Get some lights. Get yeah, some I agree with you. And some scrim. As filmmakers, we used to light a scene and then boost the practicals. Now, this whole look that I'm seeing on Netflix, this what I call the natural look, is where the practicals are so good 
that you literally can just insert your people into the scene and you don't need that much lighting. I mean, I go on, we go on sets, we see like a little light panel here just to kind of mm, add a fill. Supplemental. When the sensitivity of these cameras came down, that was the biggest game changer mm. that I can even talk about. And it looks more real. Yeah, so Mandy, any comments on the, on the thread? Yeah, we have a lot of people agreeing that there's no better camera than the one in your pocket. And then yes. we have a, um, a comment here that says, you can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. There's always a difference between a good photog and an asshole with a camera. Ooh, so nicely nice. put. Yeah, I, like, I like that one. That's, that's my new line. Does he have a trademark on it? Ask him if that's TM'd because I want to use that. And then um, back when we were talking about live streaming from DSLM or DSLR, um, somebody, I forget who it was, said that the Z cam actually is capable of doing that. I'm not sure uh -huh. if Eric is, um, knows about that. So, yeah, I, I, it, you can, it has an ethernet port on the back, so you can definitely use their software for it. Um, I'm not sure how live streaming would look from the camera itself with the Wi-Fi. I mean, it, you can monitor it fairly well. There's a lot of la latency, but um, yeah, I mean, it definitely has live capabilities, but I don't know if you could actually live stream with it via Wi-Fi on it on the camera. I want to I want to ask a question to the people of the viewers: Is what are we going to be talking about three years from now? Well, it seems like the yeah. trends are coming down to look, since image quality is not really an issue anymore. It's coming down to feature like feature wars, and mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and then ergonomics. You know what I mean? I, I, I yeah, don't we know. Did have, I didn't anticipate did this problem. Android thing. <laughs> Gone, Mandy. Yeah, we did have a comment earlier, I think it was from Nino, um, about how it's now just about software features. Nothing, the hardware doesn't really matter. Well, and then obviously ergonomics, because, you know, uh, if I need more outs, you need a bigger camera, you just need a different form factor for certain things. Well, but okay, but like, I, I don't know much about, you know, I really don't know much about the internals of cameras or anything like that, but there was this dialogue and I could, I could be way in the past here, but I'm talking about the idea of being able to have a camera that you can literally go in open source wise and create it hmm. as like, like you have a 3D printer. Yeah. I can create my I mean, own that, camera. Yeah, no, that, that'd be interesting. I, I think it would probably be a buggy mess because we don't know what we're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, why not? We have open source kind of com computer stuff. So, but most most I mean, I'm not. I'm personally not a guy who wants to build computers anymore, and I don't know if I really be interested in building a camera, um, or at least how it uh, how it works. I do like that you know that manufacturers are definitely pushing a lot more firmware updates to these cameras and unlocking even more potential from them. Look, they're they're basically computers in a box with a lens on it. That's wow. Really cool. Mandy, I want to take a final question here. And then predictions, maybe? Yeah, well, what is missing yeah. from the camera market and what will we see in 2020? Well, there you go. Well, that was kind of the question. Anything in the comments on that yet? Mitch from Cinema 5D just says Nino's right that it all will be all about the software. But Clayton, why don't you wrap this out? What, what do you think? Built-in ND filters. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is, right. this is something that people complain a lot about, these small form factor cameras. So I guess one of my predictions, I don't know when it's going to happen, but that process needs to move, obviously, from a mechanical thing. It needs room like this as well as uh, radial room and space to a process that's, both, that's an electrochemical process hmm. where you can have that uh, in as small space as you want because that's how it works. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I think it's on the way. So. Well, there's one other thing we didn't talk about, which is liquid lens technology. Mm. And I know right. that both RED <clears throat> and Panavision are claiming patents on you know, liquid lens technology. This is going to be great for these, these iPhones and that. It's the idea that you can use a, a liquid to actually, it's like in your eye. You're, you're not changing you're... the shape of the element. Exactly. Uh, with, because it's liquid so that you don't need multiple element lenses. Yes, exactly. Okay, Mandy, yeah. why don't you wrap us out? Yep, thank you for watching today. Uh, we had a very good conversation. Thank you for chiming in with all your questions and comments. Um, next week we will be off, but we'll be having a 4th of July sale, so stay tuned to our Facebook page for details on that. A big thank you to ICANN who provided the lighting and our sponsors, Canon, Rode, and Kessler, and we'll see you guys in two weeks.